I think I was first asked to speak on this topic because uh, a lot of my students were really angry with me when I asked them to put their phones away or when I pointed at them, hey, why did you naturally pick up your phone? Why did you lift your screen automatically? You're not doing anything. And they thought that I am the mas master of this uh, uh, sort of uh, topic about uh, screens and apps, but I'm not. What is identity? So identity is not something which is fixed. I didn't identify myself as a, a globe-trotting teacher when I was 15 or 18 or 21. It's an ever-changing view of self. So we're constantly reviewing what our identity is and it's based on uh, personal experiences. And it also depends on context. Where do I identify as an international educator? We all choose our identity based on different contexts, our experiences, and based on what is our view of self. Uh, so how do young people develop their identities? What do they do? Uh, after a lot of research, I figured out that most young people develop their identity by interactions, be it social, um, be it uh, online these days, and by trial and error, and by being in a different context. So their context is very important in them uh, finding out what their identity is. Uh, so our next question is, how does this age of apps and screens and mobile phones affect these factors in which young people uh, uh, develop their identity. There's a, there's a good book, Life on Screen, by Sherry Turkel. Mobile apps and digital screens have sort of become identity playground, and uh, most of us have multiple personas online. Most of our students have multiple personas online. We constantly keep changing our identity. We keep trying new things. We keep sort of uh, going back to things which are popular, or we're going, coming back with new things. So we're constantly trying to change our identity. And we have this freedom in this online version uh, to try a new identity without any fear of failure. Um, but before the age of this multiple screens and multiple apps, finding your identity was slightly difficult. The context always was fixed. Now you have different context. You have a context, different context going on in Snapchat. Something is popular in Snapchat. Something else is popular on Facebook. Something else is going on Twitter. Something else is going on Instagram. So all these apps, they have all different contexts. And you can sort of pick and choose, get out of one, get into the another one. And very, very fluidly, multiple times a day. So you can do that. But before, um, the context used to be fixed. and. Um, there had to be self-reflection to figure out who you are. Uh, recently, I came across uh, this little interview clip uh, for Emily Sande. If you watched uh, 2012 London Olympics, she sang in the opening ceremony from there. Uh, she was the local girl from Scotland, and she was given an opportunity to sing for the Olympics, and she was not very popular famous then. She became famous. So she is from Scotland, and she struggled with figuring out her identity being a mixed-race kid. So uh, Emily Sande there struggled because she didn't have the opportunity to go on uh, to see other people like her. She was in a fixed context. She was in a school by herself, the only mixed race kid, and she had to struggle through it. She had, to, she had questions. She didn't say that she'd had a bad upbringing. She had good friends. Everything was good. She still had questions about herself, and she self-reflected on those, and she developed her identity that way. So that is a big difference in how uh, young people now find out their identity, and then young people before when the age of apps used to find out their identity. Now, another important source of literature which you want to read is talking about multidimensional thinking. Howard Gardner, a really famous uh, author, uh, had the theory of multiple intelligences, recently wrote a book. Uh, it's called The App Generation. And a lot of my ideas are not my original here, really. Uh, they have been developed from uh, reading these books. Uh, so he talks a lot. He's done a lot of research uh, with young kids for a long period of time. He talked to them. Uh, there are focus groups and different methods of research. Uh, and what he found out was that young people these days on social media and everywhere else they have this desirable and polished self there. They can remove all the blemishes or all the faults which they have, which all of us have, 
and they present themselves as somebody who is perfect. And a lot of, uh, in his uh, book, he's uh, quoted a lot of students saying, uh, it's important you show that you're having a good life. It doesn't matter if you're not having a good life. So that's one of the main thing that's what happens with your persona online, with our persona, it's nothing, nothing new. We all know about that. Our holiday pictures look better than our experiences sometimes. And all the failures are downplayed. And the emphasis is mainly on looking good. Very rarely you'll find a young person saying, oh no, I really failed in this maths test, or I didn't get anything in science lesson today. I really struggle. Nobody posts like things like that. So all the failures are taken out. So this becomes a competition of who can look better and best and always having a good time. Um, what does it do though? So, and then he further pressed on those teenagers who said, uh, why, why is your persona online different from your, is your persona online different from offline? And most young people believe that they're the same person who is who they represent online. And there's some truth to that. Um, and the truth is that teenagers, when they develop identities, they need different contexts. But when you go online, all the con contexts are collapsed. You might write something for your friends. You might write something for your like, personal friend, close friend. But you cannot control who sees it. And those collapsing contexts sort of put pressure on young people. And they feel that it's them. Yes, it is them. But you, we, are, we should not have that information. In, in a life without apps, we would not have that information. But in a life with apps, we have that information. And then there is additional pressure of digital permanence. Whatever they say amongst themselves, if you're in a physical world, no apps, you have a little tiff and you forget about it, or you say something to somebody, you forget about it and you move on. But in digital world, whatever you write usually remains. And there's this digital permanence that sort of puts more pressure on young people. And then they're constantly reminded of who they are, what they wrote, so you cannot forget. So all these issues come up. And then how they respond in real life is they stop taking any risks. This, they resort, young people resort to risk aversion. So stop taking any risk in being wrong or doing something where there's a chance of embarrassment or being wrong. So all these social pressures from online sort of so move into the realm of the uh, uh, physical day-to-day -day life. Some therapists who were uh, dealing with young people who were suffering from a lot of stress and anxiety, uh, they they came out with, like, young people have something called planning delusion. Uh, they want a packaged self of themselves. They know they have this plan. They have this permanent, this perfect plan. They've planned everything, that I will get GPA of 3.59, and then I'll go to so-and-so university, and then I'll get this degree, then I'll do an internship here, and then I'll get this job, and I'll be this person. So young people more and more feel that if they have their life planned, they will not have to face any hardships or have to take any risk. So there's this big planning delusion cropping up. And what, what young people and what we are focusing these days on, what are young people doing, not who they are being? The focus moves from, oh, I do horse riding, I uh, do service, I do GPA, uh, of 3.9 and I do, do, do. So what do you do instead of who you are? So there's lack of who I am. So the identity really is not found and we're constantly looking at people uh, who have these ideas of somebody has done this, I can do this, there's no risk and uh, we become a person who does things for a packaged sort of image and self. Um, Another research was, another survey was uh, about developing a meaningful philosophy in life. And the researchers asked this question, uh, how important is developing a meaningful philosophy in life to you? In 1970, 80% of freshmen in, in, in the US said it is very important. And that number in 20, 2012, 2012 dropped down to uh, 40%. The young people 
sort of are losing by being in an instant, instantaneous world, and losing the concept of planning ahead or looking ahead. And uh, there's this new problem if you ask a lot of people, um, where would you be in five years from now? They really struggle to answer that question, whereas they have really good plans for next three weeks and solid foolproof plans for next three weeks. So this ability of thinking beyond is being taken down by constantly being rewarded and being sort of given instant gratification. So delayed grat gratitude is sort of taking a seat back. And there's, ev there's evidence for that now. Um, so that leads to, so what do teens do uh, on, uh, on screens and apps? What do we all do on screens and apps? I'm not just blaming young people and teenagers. Uh, we spend a lot of time. There's two ways we spend time on uh, screens and apps. One is passive consumption, another one is active engagement. And uh, this is a relative new, relatively a new uh, research topic. Not a lot of has been, research has been done, and it's slowly picking up. Uh, researchers sometimes sort of get confused, so like doing homework uh, or using an interactive software for learning, should it be count as uh, digital screen time? or should it be just part of learning? Whereas uh, passive consumption, watching a video to learn and making notes, what is that? Is that? So there's a lot of uh, sort of confusion, what is passive consumption of media and what is active engagement? Um, we all fall into this passive consumption of watching the scroll of video after video, uh, cat video or um, cricket video for me. So I was like, oh, Sachin Tanilkar, 1984. Oh, what did he do in 1986? So we, our favorite sport team, oh, that dunk shot by somebody else, or that home run, and then, oh, he did that in that match. So we, we fall into this trap of passively consuming media, and that increases a lot of screen time. And screen time becomes very problematic. Uh, uh, young people especially are spending seven to eight hours a day, often, on just looking at screen. And how does that impact their health, uh, their brain development, uh, because their brain is still developing. What, what, what impact does it have? What is the research to show? And that's another dilemma uh, with researchers in this field. So you cannot research in young children. A, it is very difficult to get somebody to say, hey, you're not going to use your phone for two months, or you're not going to use technology for two months. Uh, it isn't quite not possible. And B, it is all the ethics of it, would you so would you do research on how would you get a good sample? So scientists rely on researching on mice uh, for this. Um, and with, with a lot of research coming in, this addiction of screens is slowly now being recognized. So last year, United Nations recognized uh, gaming disorder as a legitimate disorder. Uh, and the, the vocabulary of addiction is uh, slowly moving away from when we talk about addictions, usually first thing comes into mind is alcohol or drugs, used to like substance addiction. But now it's a, it's a changing to impulse control uh, challenge. So we cannot control our impulse. And then that can be sort of applied broadly to a lot of different uh, areas, not just alcohol or, or cigarettes or drugs. And now a gaming disorder comes under that sort of addiction, which is impulse control. And a lot of countries are taking sort of uh, strong actions. France, this year, last year, they banned mobile phone use in class, but young children or school-going children up to the age of 15 were allowed to use phones in break time. This year, they're totally banned for up to the age of 15 uh, use of mobile phones in, in their classroom. Australia decided against it. A lot of pressure in the Australian government was to ban, ban, follow the suit and ban phones. Uh, but what I like the education minister said, that being open to technologies of the future doesn't mean we have to accept all their uses. And it might be a premature uh, thing to do, and then it might be a good thing to do. We'll get data on it and results from it, so we'll figure out was it a good decision or a bad decision. But this is, these are the, some drastic steps some governments are feeling to take uh, to, to help their young people sort of get away from screens, especially during education. And there's a big argument against uh, screens and like phones and technology being good for education and learning as well. The first one is the mouse in a casino. So mouse in a casino is a, an interesting uh, experiment done by the uh, University of Seattle. Uh, I've forgotten the name. Uh, and uh, what, what the researchers did is they put mice and fluctuating lights 
and in them like changing lights, mimicking constant change of screen uh, for them for about six to eight hours and uh, 10 days continuously and then um, let them roam freely in a sort of a free area. And uh, I'll come back to that one. So this is what happened. So this was a mouse, a normal mouse, which uh, when you let a mouse out in the open area, they're always skeptical of going out in the open. So the first mice, mouse stayed right at the edges, never went in the middle, out in the open. So his cognitive function is, is sharp, he's looking out for danger and doing things right. The hyperactive mouse, or the mouse which was shown on the screen, became really mental. And look at the number of lines. Is that's the path he traced in the same amount of time in the open field. He was more prone to go in open areas, and he was really, really hyperactive. And that's the changing screens and lights can do. And the second experiment, second stage of that experiment was, uh, uh, so both mice were given two objects to familiarize with. They familiarized with both. And one of the objects was changed, and you had a novel object. Uh, so after one hour, they were put back in the maze. And uh, one object was new, and another one was the familiar one. So the mice, which didn't have any digital time, so spent a little bit of time on familiar object, and then started exploring the new object. And the mouse, which had a lot of digital time, spent almost equal amount of time on both objects. So there are grave implications of on short-term memory uh, if we are constantly changing and digital screens. So this is the result uh, of recent experiments. And I'm sure there's more research which is going on and we can sort of, nothing is absolute and it also depends on individuals and how you use screens. But this is one of the latest research which is being done that uh, shows us how constantly flicking through screens and constantly staring at screens can affect our brains. Thank you.